please welcome to the stage Alex Bloomberg. My, uh, my, my journey from a uh, non-profit journalist to a CEO. And it's a very unlikely journey um, because for one thing, I don't have an MBA, I don't have any business experience. Um, uh, I didn't have any business experience actually. And, um, and in fact, before I got this job as CEO of my own company, uh, I hadn't even worked in the private sector for 20 years. Um, in fact, the last full-time job I had at a for-profit institution was when I uh, bagged groceries in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio as a teenager at a, at a store called Thriftway. It was for-profit, but it went out of business. So I guess it, tech, even technically that wasn't for-profit, really. Um, so, uh, so today what I'm going to talk about is sort of like how did this happen uh, and what I have learned along the way um, uh, making my way to... Uh, to where I am today. So, um, and uh, so going back, I started, I, I, I worked for many, many years at This American Life. Uh, I'm going to speed through this history to get to the good parts. Uh, but I, I worked at This American Life for a long time, and I did, you know, all sorts of stories about prisoners putting on, you know, uh, plays in prison, about uh, putting on a performance of Hamlet in prison, or going to an aircraft carrier, or people impersonate their mothers. And then I, uh, and then at around, 2008, uh, I did a story that sort of was a little bit of a turning point. Um, it was a story about why banks were lending lots and lots of money to people who couldn't possibly have any chance of paying it back. Uh, and I'll just play a little clip from the story. That, that story was called The Giant Pool of Money. And, and it started with, um, with, a, with a guy named Clarence who had taken out a, who had three not very steady part-time jobs. Uh, and made about $45,000 a year, but had somehow gotten a gigantic loan from the bank. Call it 540 for round figures. You basically borrowed $540,000 from the bank, and they didn't check your income. All right. It's a no-income verification loan. They don't call me up and say, you know, how much money? They don't do that. I mean, it's, it's almost like you pass a guy in the street and you say, hey, you lend me $540,000? He said, well, what do you do? I got a job. OK. I mean, it, 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 it seems as if it's that casual, even though there are a lot of papers that get filled out and stuff flies all over with the faxes and the emails and all like that. Essentially, um, that's the process. Would, would, would you have loaned you the money? I wouldn't have loaned me the money. and. Um, Nobody that I know would have loaned me the money. I mean, I know guys who are criminals that wouldn't lend me that money, and they'd break your kneecap. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know why the bank did it. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, $540,000, a person with bad credit. So um, that was like a revelation. That uh, Clarence was a, a revelation to me and, and, and started that story. And the story was basically sort of like explaining, well, why did all of a sudden the financial industry turn on its head and start lending money to people that they never would have lent, it, lent money to before? Um, and sort of the disaster that became of all that. That became, a, the giant pool of money was a big hit at This American Life. And it sort of like, it, and it taught me that like the same tools that we're using uh, to tell stories about you know, heartbreak and love and you know, funny family incidents, we can also sort of bring to really complicated topics like you know, uh, exotic mortgage-based derivatives. Um, and, so, uh, and so from that, uh, with the help of uh, my co-reporter on this story, Adam Davidson, we started something called Planet Money, uh, which, and it, thank you. <laughs> Some Planet Money fans in the audience. Uh, <laughs> so many things that I'm going to say on stage tonight, like 10 years ago, I, can't, I would never have been able to imagine saying. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Shout out if you love the TED spread. Uh, all right. So, um, so ten, Planet Money, uh, we started up, and it became very, you know, very successful. And, um, and uh, 
and it, it really showed that, like, yes, you can take these, these, the, this, this suite of skills that we sort of developed at Planet Money and apply them across a bunch of different subject areas. And I was watching this happen and watching Planet Money sort of grow and get its own huge audience and generate its own excitement. Um, and so I was like, oh, this podcast thing could really work. Um, and that was one lesson I learned. The other lesson was one that I probably shouldn't have learned, but I learned anyway. Um, I learned that I'm, well, I thought I learned that I'm good at business. Uh, and the, and that, that lesson, that, that wrong lesson I learned from, from uh, this uh, t-shirt project that we did. Um, so we did a project at Planet Money where we, uh, we said we're going to explore the global economy by, through the simple t-shirt, through the lens of a simple t-shirt. Simple t-shirt, we're on our back, but it's basically made all around the world. And what we were going to do is we are going to make a t-shirt and follow it around the world as it got made, from the cotton, where the fields where the cotton was grown to the factories in Bangladesh and Colombia, where the workers actually sew, cut and sewed the t-shirt. And we were going to interview everybody along the step, all along the way, and we were going to do this big project. And then at the end, we were going to sell our listeners the t-shirt. And so we sort of like talked about this, did a whole bunch of podcasts about it, and we said, if you want to buy it, go to Kickstarter. And so we thought we'd get like $50,000, maybe you know, a couple thousand people sign up. In the end, we made almost $600,000 and, and sold 25,000 t-shirts. Um, so now I'm thinking like, God damn, am I hot shit. I, because uh, <laughs> I have, I, I've created this hit podcast and, and we're making money. Uh, and so in the, you know, in the long story tradition of people who think they're hot shit, uh, I decided to, I decided I didn't need anybody. I was going to branch out on my own. So, um, so I went and, 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 you know, I had some evidence, right? Like, so if you look, I said, you know, we can start making podcasts independently of NPR. Um, and it's not just, like, I love NPR. I love public media. I love everything that it's done. Not the best business people in the world. So I was thinking, like, maybe we could apply sort of like some out, you know, we could maybe if we took business lessons from sort of outside of the world of public media and sort of applied them to the same creative force that we have inside the world of public media, we could grow the, grow the economic pie. So I thought, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go try to raise money. And if you, you know, my, my argument was if you look at the top podcasts out there, they're all sort of from the NPR world. I know how to do that. Uh, you know, podcasts are coming to the car. There's going to be a, you know, there's going to be a button in your car where you can play podcasts. You know, there's, you know, I had all these statistics and stuff. Um, and, uh, and what I was going to, and so what, and what I decided to do was do a podcast about trying to start this business. Uh, that podcast became Startup, uh, uh, which uh, we, uh, uh, which, uh, so, so started, the, started the business in the summer of 2014 and launched uh, the, the Startup podcast in, in September of 2015, so almost exactly a year ago today. Uh, and what I ended up documenting, though, was this, I thought it was going to be sort of a publicity stunt, but I ended up documenting a surprisingly emotional journey. And, um, and so I'm just going to play you a couple of clips from that. Um, so the first, <clears throat> the first uh, episode began with me pitching an investor, um, a guy named Chris Saka. So Chris Saka is like, it's sort of like saying, you know what, I don't, I've never painted anything in my life, and I'm going to learn how to paint. Uh, and I'm going to go um, talk to Jeff Koons, or like I'm going to like, or if uh, I'm going to resuscitate the ghost of Pablo Picasso and then get him to teach me lessons. It's like sort of a crazy thing. It's a crazy place to start. Uh, and so what I what I, so, but I didn't know that because I like I'd met him through a, a story, so I had sort of this weird access to him that most people wouldn't have had. So I went and pick, pitched him, and I thought it was going to be all great. Ended up not working out so well. So I'm just going to play you a little clip from that pitch. Uh, part of the problem was we met at the sushi restaurant in LA, and I had my little deck with my little laptop, um, and I was, and then he was like, and I was getting ready to show it to him, and then he was like, yeah, actually, let's take a walk. And so I had, I was like, but my laptop. He was like, a, a pitch deck is a crutch. Let's just take a walk. So, um, so we're out on Pico Boulevard, like walking under underpasses, and I'm trying to pitch him, and I have my microphone, and I'm recording the whole thing, uh, and it, needless to say, it didn't go so well. You got to tighten up your story. So the, we'll start again. Yeah. So you've now kind of All right. really tight this time. How you're going to make money doing this? So you, you make money a combination. So there's three major 
There's three major revenue streams. I start again. I meander my way through the ad rates, planet money. At a certain point, I find myself deep into an explanation of my friend's successful Kickstarter project. Chris interrupted. You lost track your own outline. Yeah, I did. What you, what you haven't given me is the outline of your story, right? Uh -huh. If I were calling an Uber right now and it said, it's going to be here in two minutes, and that was all the time you had, uh -huh. what are you doing? So I'm making a network of digital podcasts uh, that we will monitor, that, that, will, that, will, that is going to meet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Didn't go so well. um, so, uh, so I, I, you know, soldiered on. Uh, but like part of what, part of so that was episode one. Uh, I would like to say there weren't that many episodes like that, but there were a lot of episodes like that. Episode two, episode three, episode four. Uh, but um, so, but what? Uh, but but as I was going through this, I was I realized like, oh, this isn't just a publicity stunt to try to get people sort of like, you know, I had all these listeners at, at Planet Money and This American Life that sort of maybe knew my work, but I couldn't bring with me because I couldn't, you know, hijack the, their podcast feeds and direct them to myself. So I had to like sort of generate some publicity about myself to sort of get a listener base for this new company that I was starting. And so that was the original idea of this. But then I, as I was in it, I was realizing, oh no, this is like some, this is a really a story that people think they know, but they don't actually know. Like business formation is something that's happening all the time. But like the story that gets told is so just the top surface of like, dude, we're killing it, or like whatever. Yeah, our startup didn't fail, but I got another idea. Whatever. It's like it, there's no, there's there's none of the actual things that are actually interesting about it. And even things that you wouldn't think that were interesting, like coming up with the name of your company. Um, it was surprisingly complicated and crazy, and there was like all these legal hurdles, and sort of the trademark reg registration process is insane, and it's this weird emotional thing. And so, like, we'd gone through like five different names, we'd hit on them that we liked, and then we'd get rejected with the trademark search, or like, we'd, you know, whatever. We'd like somebody else would decide, no, nah, I can't, we can't name it that. Anyway, so we'd been doing it for months and months and months. And finally, my co-founder, Matt, and I were like at his house one day, and we were like sort of, we went down this sort of like foreign, like maybe we name it a foreign name. Like what's, a, you know, what's Italian for sound? Uh, and then we're like, no, that's lame. And then we sort of somehow hit on Esperanto. And, uh, and we came up with a name that we really liked. And then I, took, I went home and I, uh, and I shared that name that we really liked. We were like, this is the one. And we'd been sort of drinking through the afternoon. And we were like totally like, by the end, we're like, yes, this is it. Uh, and, uh, so I came home uh, that afternoon and I shared it with my wife. Orello. Orello? Orello. What is that, what is that supposed to mean? Well, it's, uh, it's ear in Esperanto. <laughs> So dumb. <laughs> so dumb, it's good though, right? <laughs> what? His idea. It came up organically. How does that come up organically? I was like, Speaking Esperanto. <laughs> So, uh, so it wasn't all just fun and laughs. Uh, there were, but but the other thing that was really um, crazy about it, uh, and we, and so part of it was just sort of mining all these like weird things and sort of like putting it out there, like all the things that, like what I realized is that like a lot of times the startup narrative gets told, it's told in retrospect, in hindsight, with all the bad parts cut out. And so what I was trying to do was put the bad parts in. Um, because I felt like, and I, I had this belief that like, if people had ever been through anything close to like this process, probably most people had had some of these same feelings. And, and so everything that was really uncomfortable or, or, or embarrassing, I tried to document. And by far, one of the most uncomfortable, embarrassing things that you can do when you're starting a business is uh, decide on how much of the business you own and how much of your, your co-founder owns. Uh, and that's the equity discussion. Um, you have to have it. Uh, and you feel like a douchebag 
having it. First of all, you're like arguing about, like, you, first of all, you have to sort of say, well, I own this much and I own this much, and that's weird. And also, you're talking about owning nothing, because nothing exists yet, but you have to do it before anything exists, because if you don't, then it gets worse later. So you have to sort of like pretend like you have this big, valuable company, even though all you have is an idea that, that you can't even come up with a name for. So, uh, so I'm, this is like literally the most probably embarrassing thing I've ever recorded about myself. It, I don't know if it'll read exactly as embarrassing right away, but when I hear it, I cringe. But this is me and my partner, Matt, trying to decide how much equity we would own. And the backstory is I came up with the idea that the company Matt joined a little bit later as sort of like I needed a business partner and he, he had business experience. And so he and I had talked and talked and really liked each other. And we, we'd finally arrived at this moment. Um, but I was coming to it from thinking like, this is my idea, you're joining, you're coming along for the ride. He was leaving a big, big, huge job to take a pay cut to zero uh, to, um, <laughs> to join. So he, had, he wanted to be compensated fairly. So this is our conversation. When I look at the breakdown, I'm thinking of like high 40s to low 50s, so like a 47, 53, or something in that range. Right. Oh. All right. Uh, I was I was afraid you were going to say that. Um, that so 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 the way I've been thinking about this is sort of like uh, I I've been so I've been talking to various people about like what you know what would be a fair situation, um, and uh, you know people various people have told me various things, um, <laughs> but nobody people. Like the highest, the highest anybody really got was like <laughs> 10, 12 percent uh, in terms of what, what they, they thought. I was arguing people up, basically. Um, I can't imagine doing this for the, the numbers that you're talking about. I just can't imagine doing it. T 10 percent is just not, like I, it, I can't give this what it needs of me at that level. So, uh, it's so horrible listening to that. I sound like such a dick, and I, 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 and and I'm wrong. As we eventually got to, like we got to a much more equitable split, 60-40, uh, which we ended up both feeling very good about. But um, but like that sort of thing. Every time we would put out an episode. I was thinking like, okay, this is going too far. We've shared too much. This is too horrible. Like, people will turn on me. This is a hateful thing to document anyway. <laughs> like, like I'm starting a business. Come on. And like, and then everybody, and like, it's already. And so far, I've managed to trick people that it's not hateful. And now they were going to re realize that I'm an awful person. Uh, but, um, but I just felt like there was something valuable to sort of revealing. That, those parts of the process as well. And then every time we would do it, like it would just get like, I went through that too. You know, so many people would sort of like come forward. Um, so, uh, so that was just really, really, so there's a couple lessons. First of all, like um, going for the pain <laughs> that you're going through like and trying to share that uh, helps. The other thing that I learned, and I'm gonna speed through because I'm running out of time, so there's, you're gonna hear a weird little audio glitch because I'm gonna speed through something. Uh, but the other thing I learned is that doing a podcast about how bad you are at selling your idea ends up helping you sell your idea. Um, so uh, we actually ended up raising 1.5 million in seed funding to, to start this company. And m the vast majority of it was raised after the start, startup podcast went on the air. That surprised me. I, my plan was, I'm going to raise the money, and then I'm going to start doing the podcasts. But the money raising was going so slow, we were like, well, let's throw up the podcast anyway. We might as well do that while we're going along. And that became the thing that sort of really sealed the deal. And I thought, I was confused about that in the beginning, and, and then I sort of realized what was going on. I think this is a lesson for any of you out there who are trying to start your thing. You're, you're battling. When you're trying to get people, like I had a pretty good track record. Like I'd won awards. I'd been, I was pretty well known in the field. Like I thought it would, I thought that I could go to people and say, look, I've done this thing and this thing, and I just want to do it more. Give me the money. Uh, <laughs> and people want a little bit more than that. Uh, and, uh, and so I kept on trying to explain to them, and they were like, podcast, 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 Wayne's World, Wayne's World, Wayne's World. And it's just sort of like this, nobody could get it. And so 
what I realized is when I did this podcast and it got a little bit of attention and people started listening to it and it sort of climbed the charts in iTunes, it was it became the it became the it became a, an example of the thing we were, we were trying to explain. And it's one thing to say I'm going to make a podcast of narrative narrative podcast full of humor and pathos, and people are like yeah yeah yeah. But then when I actually did it, and they're like oh that's what you're talking about. Yeah, I want to fund that. And that was the thing that sort of like I think turned people. So to me, I would have or I would have started that process earlier. I would have gotten that thing up and running earlier. I would have just. Instead of trying, you're never going to explain the thing as well as you can show them the thing. So, like, <laughs> so like that's definitely a lesson to take away. Um, so, uh, so now we have three shows up and running: uh, Startup, Reply All, Mystery Show. We have a couple more on the way. Um, where we are now, we're like. Um, uh, we have a total audience of almost two million. Our revenue in the first year was two million dollars because of like insanely high ad rates. Uh, which, uh, after listening to Heather's talk, I'm, we really, really need to figure out a second revenue stream. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we're at 24 employees uh, and, and and probably growing. Um, and I've. I'm going to another weird audio glitch as I get to my last slide. So one of the things, and then I just want to talk, I was going to turn about lessons, but like screw the lessons. Here's the thing that I'm most excited about, about doing this thing. Um, and it's going to be, and I'm going to just play you this. You know, I have a weird PJ said we need to get OK. Uh, the thing I'm most excited about is, uh, with, is um, when you start a business, you sort of think all these, you think this is, you know, maybe this will happen, maybe this will happen. And at this point, a year into it, I am now starting to see things that I never could have imagined happening happen. And that is the most exciting thing. And the example of that is uh, from the show Reply All. They performed here uh, last night. Hopefully, some of you got to see them. It's an amazing show. Show about the internet. PJ Vote is right there. Alex Goldman, somewhere in the audience. I don't see him. Uh, Alex, are you around? I can't see anyway. Sorry. Oh, he's in, he's in the back. Uh, so, uh, but they, um, so they were the first show that we launched a, a, after a startup, and um, they were in it from the very beginning, and we didn't know what we were doing, and we came on, and like we we sort of recorded this. Our first episode was up, and we were trying to, and then we were like, and everything we were like, everything was new, and we we're like, okay, so outside of public radio, what do we say at the end of shows? Like, do we, you know, like, do you, do, who do we thank? What do we say? And so we sort of had to come up with it on the fly, like, who we did. And then we got to Matt Lieber, who's my co-founder running the business side, is a person that doesn't really exist. PJ Knox both came from public radio. I came from public radio. Matt Lieber, as, 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 a, as a function, doesn't really exist in, in, in public radio. We didn't know what to say about him in the credits, but we definitely wanted to talk about him in the credits. Uh, and so they came to Matt Lieber steers the ship. Uh, and they said that for a couple of times. And then they started sort of inventing new things to say about Matt Lieber. And it became a thing that they did at the end of the show. Reply All is me, PJ Vogt, and Alex Goldman. We were produced this week by Shruti Pinamanani and Chris Neary. We were edited by Alex Bloomberg and Paul Ford. We were mixed by the Reverend John Delore. Matt Lieber is a comforter accidentally warmed by the radiator. <laughs> And that happened, <laughs> and then every show then, they would do a, do a new Matt Lieber. Matt Lieber is the solution to a problem that's been bothering you for a while. <laughs> Matt Lieber's a window in a room where you didn't think there was one. <laughs> Matt Lieber is Estonia. <laughs> uh, and it became such a thing that like, uh, that, uh, 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 well, there's a site called Reddit. Um, uh, disappeared. Um, uh, what are all the, the Matt Liebers? And then they sort of listed all the Matt Liebers. And then there's like, is a, a Matt Lieber is a memory of summer and a winter that seems to go on forever. Matt Lieber is the smell of la laundry. Uh, the HBO Go login. So all these Matt Liebers. <laughs> so that in itself is wonderful enough. But then the thing that, the most magical thing happened, which is, this show, show number, which one was it? 30, 36. Uh, so um, I'm going to go over a little bit. I'm sorry. But show number 36 happened, and I'm just going to start the show. This is the exact way, unedited. This is how it started. From Gimlet, this is Reply All, a show about the internet. I'm PJ Vogt. And I'm Alex Goldman. 
In this week's episode, it's a little different. We're going to focus mostly on how computers work. And we're going to start by interviewing an expert on transistors. This guy doesn't seem to be picking up. I feel kind of relieved. <laughs> I have zero questions about transistors. Could we just roll the credits? Reply All is me, PJ Vote, with Alex Goldman. We were produced this week by Tim Howard, Shruti Pinamanini, and Fia Benin. We were edited this week by Alex Bloomberg. Our show was mixed by the Reverend John Delore. Matt Lieber is a job that you love so much that you actually sort of forget to go outside. And then one day you just find yourself wondering, has the 4th of July happened yet? And so you look out a window and you realize actually it's the end of August. Summer's almost over. And you just feel this tiny little teaspoon of regret. And then you realize you could just go outside. The building has an elevator. What if you took it? outside. Yeah, it's pretty beautiful. Where are we right now? We're at Central Park, bro. We're at Central Park. <laughs> And they go on, and they have an entire adventure in New York City, and it's all part of the Matt Lieber. And, uh, <laughs> and it was one of our most popular shows, and it, and, it, and it is something that I never could have imagined when I started this company. And that, I feel like, is the reason that we're all trying to start things, is because what we want to do is make a place where things that we couldn't have imagined can grow. Uh, and it's been like... Um, Unbelievably gratifying to see that happen with Gimlet. So, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>